Beautiful soul, have you ever wanted to speak to angels? Do you believe angels can support you in your daily life? If this is you, go to my website homepage, theangelmedium.com and sign up for my weekly angel message email. As a gift for signing up, I'm giving you access to free resources, including 31 healing meditations that if you do daily are going to help you hear your angels and your own intuition more clearly. Start using these today and you'll see changes in 31 days. Now, take a deep breath. Feel the presence of your angels as they fill you with love, joy, peace, bliss, and ease. And remember, your angels say the messages that resonate with you in today's episode are meant just for you. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. Friends, today I have a very special guest. She's my friend, but she's also an author, Maureen Lurk. Um, Our girls are friends. And she just came out with a new book, which is just huge. Your first book. I remember like going through the airport and mom was like, hey, you know, that's (laughs) so-and-so's mom's book. Um, And we knew you guys better. Back then, but yeah. um, I don't use any of like the kids' names on the podcast. So yeah, so you have Hex Education, and we don't normally talk about witches on the podcast, but I thought what a fun thing to do for Halloween. Happy spooky season. Ooh, welcome, <laughs> Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. You know, one of the things that I just love too, I don't know if you know, there's like a third author who publishes a lot of books in the subdivision, but there's three of us. And I love that our girls get to see that writing can actually be a profession because I didn't think it really could be back in the day. (laughs) Right, exactly. I mean, it's all I've ever wanted to do Um, since when I was little. I was such a voracious reader and was always like, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, who I want to be when I'm older. It's definitely a profession. Um, You need to have a little bit of a thick skin for it. But I mean, there's nothing I would rather be doing. Yeah, a hundred percent. So we've got a lot to dive into here. And Maureen's got some angel stories, but I want you to start by sharing what Hex Education is about. Like give the listeners like a little background. Sure, sure. So Hex Education is about three lapsed witches who dabbled um, with some spells and wish witchcraft, um, more like wish fulfillment, I would say, when they were in college, just kind of having fun with it. Um, and then it started to work. They passed their midterm, their crush talked to them kind of thing. So then they started to ramp it up. Um, and one night it got out of hand and they started a fire that burned down their dorm. So fast forward 20 years later, and no one found out that they were the ones that had caused this fire. Fast forward 20 years, and the main character, Sarah, she's living a great life as a luxury realtor on the North Shore. She's, you know, married to an adoring husband, has two twin teenagers. And there is a reunion, a commemoration anniversary ceremony for um, when the fire occurred. And she is reunited with her old coven. And while they're together, the magic sparks again between them, but it kind of gets turbocharged. So as whereas before, Sarah was still using magic kind of in secret to like, you know, help make school lunches. And, you know, instead of doing the target run, you know, your fridge just stocks with food. Who wouldn't want that? Um, But after she's reunited with her coven, everything goes turbocharged. So her fridge is stocking 30 pounds of lunch meat. Her cat starts talking. So it's a little bit of suburban hijinks there. So she and her coven need to work together to figure out how to kind of calm the magic down. Amazing. This seems so fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun to write. Yes. So what, because your books tend to be more supernatural. I know that you're going to do like a third one. Will Mm -hmm. there be an element of that in the third one? And I don't know if people, if you don't know Maureen, um, you should totally follow her over on Instagram and wherever you want to send people for your website. But do you, couple questions. 
there's a movie that's going to be tied with one of these. And Fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> I have no control over it. So, yes. I mean, I'm hoping it actually happens. <laughs> oh my goodness. So tell us about that. And then will there be kind of like a supernatural element to the third book? And how did you kind of like, what interest did you have before to kind of even start writing the books? Yeah, sure. Oh, so one thing I want to note is that I write under, it's my mom's maiden name. So it's Maureen Kilmer okay. is uh, my pen name, so to speak. So the movie stuff with Suburban Hell, um, it was a lot of fun to kind of go through that process. So it's been optioned for development, which means that um, these producers in this studio have the right to make this piece of IP, so to speak. So we had several offers from different producers, but the one we went with is Paul Feig and Sam Raimi. Paul Feig did Bridesmaids and every kind of like female, you know, comedy movie kind of in the past like 10 years almost. Um, And Sam Raimi, Evil Dead, Poltergeist, all the big horse. We have one comedy and one horror working together. (laughs) They pulled in um, Joanna, the screenwriter and showrunner from the show The Bear, which I absolutely love. So, yeah, so she's supposed to be working on the script. There was the writer's strike that just ended, thankfully. So, you know, I'm just waiting to hear where we are and what's going on. I unfortunately don't have a lot of pull. People are like, oh, can't you be an extra in the movie? And I'm like, "Mm, (laughs) maybe. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, it was a really fun process. I got to meet everybody over Zoom, um, which was also hilarious because, you know, there are all these big Hollywood people and I'm you know, in my house in the suburbs, you know, wearing, I was wearing sweatpants that I bought at um, the grocery store at Aldi. Um, They're great sweatpants. (laughs) But, you know, it it was, it was never more obvious to me that I am not living a Hollywood lifestyle. You know, my dogs are barking in the background and they're all like, you know, Paul Feig joined the call. He was on set, you know, Sam Raimi's doing sound mixing in Berlin and I'm, you know, wearing sweatpants from Aldi. So, so it's been a really fun process. We'll see what happens. You know, Hollywood is so weird and unpredictable. So I'm hoping that things work out. And then what was your oh second question was about the third book. Yeah. Yeah. Will that include like a supernatural element too? Yes. Yes. So the third book is, um, it'll be out next summer and it's called Nightmare of a Trip. And it's about a couple who it's, Basically, National Lampoon's Vacation meets Poltergeist. So it's about a Midwest couple who are (laughs) journeying with their kids down to, well, it's Disney World, but it's not called Disney World because I don't want Disney to come after me. Um, So they're going to Magic Land um, and road tripping there, and they pick up a ghost along the way. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm just, I'm revising that one right now, and that's been a lot of fun. I've taken road trips with my own kids, and there is enough horror there without adding a ghost so it's been fun (laughs) you're hysterical and I was laughing before about the all these sweatpants on because I've got my TJ Maxx sweatpants on right now and it's great (laughs) yeah it's fantastic so when it comes to this what got you interested in writing books around this topic or genre genre so I grew up you know, watching horror movies. And I actually had a babysitter when I was like six. Um, I don't think she was brought back, but she let me watch Poltergeist. And I was like, this isn't scary at all. Like, you know, I mean, it was scary, but I thought it was just cool. And so, you know, growing up always when I would have sleepovers, I would be like, who wants to watch Halloween? No one wanted to watch (laughs) Halloween but me. (laughs) Um, So I've always had this love of horror and writing you know when I sat down to write Suburban Hell it actually first started as a story just about neighbors solving a mystery you know we had moved we live in a great subdivision great area you know you know as <laughs> wonderful people but there was there was something about suburbia where everybody knew you know everybody's business a little bit you know good and bad you yeah. know but also good hey you know my kid is homesick from school. Can your kid pick up the homework kind of thing? Uh-huh. So good and bad. So I started just writing this suburban mom, you know, mystery. And I was like, something is missing here. And then it came to me, oh, a demon. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I knew I could use that as a way to talk about some of the larger issues and larger things that moms face. You know, 
horror isn't really the scariest things about horror aren't necessarily Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger or whatever. There's something very real there, you know, with Michael Myers and Halloween, it's yes, there's a crazy person stalking babysitters, but it's also about being that babysitter and being in charge of children on your own and, you know, coming into that responsibility. And that's all horror kind of or paranormal starts from like a truth and a fear. And then it's taken onto this really big elevated stage that probably will never happen. Okay. So I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the podcast before, but I don't watch like horror flicks. Like the, the one that I have watched, uh, like scream, that's about mm-hmm. as intense as I can do. And then and I, that's I, intense. So credit. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, but I never thought of it from that perspective, but I could totally see that mm-hmm. where it's maybe, I don't know, therapeutic for some people. It really is. And it's something where you can explore, you know, if you're into horror, you can kind of explore those fears from a safe, safe distance. And because it's done in this elevated way that it's like, well, that probably won't happen, but you can still kind of see that fear portrayed, but just in this almost ridiculous manner. And, you know, I also think that as society, sometimes we, tend to look for those kind of horror stories when something either kind of dark is going on in our society or we're, you know, kind of moving past that, like, you know, going through the pandemic. Horror is having a huge explosion right now because people are like, okay, I've dealt with real life horror stuff for so long. You know, maybe I want to read about a demon moving next door, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That is so fascinating. Well, I know like in the spiritual community, a lot of times we talk about surrender, releasing, acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've written about this before where in order to go to those places and really almost like unlock a very deep energy within myself, Mm -hmm. I very much, and I, I know that this goes against what they say with manifestation, but I have to go to the worst case scenario for myself. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, okay, you know, and actually it's been happening recently. I've never had panic attacks, but I've started to have a couple and Mm -hmm. I like start crying and I can't breathe. And it's been very intense, but I've had to let myself go to the worst case scenario really let Mm -hmm. myself sit with that and because I think I'm putting too much pressure on myself right now like totally well you know like when you're writing and you you want it to be good but then you've been looking at it for so long and (laughs) yes this is just crap you know and you're thinking to yourself like I don't know you you just get doom and gloom with yourself Mm -hmm. very easy but back to my original point like it does release something when you go, okay, this isn't the end of the world. Like if this option for whatever reason, if it did or did not work out, I am Mm going to be fine either way. And totally releases. Did you find that at all with like horror for you? Like it releases something that allows you to live more like when you're releasing that fear. I think for sure, you know, I think that, I mean, I do that too. I'll think about, and I, and I'll have to consciously tell myself what is the worst thing that could happen, you know, whatever it is, even if it's something minor. And then I, you know, quickly figure out what the worst thing that could happen would be and then go, and would I be okay? And if, and the answer is always yes. And it's like going through that then releases me from having to, I wouldn't want to say worry about it. Mm -hmm. But having to stress as much because I, you know, if whatever I'm doing, if the worst thing happens or if I fail, I know that it'll still be okay. So it's almost like you have to push yourself to that point and go, see, I'll be fine. And then, of course, I mean, the worst thing possible usually never happens. So it's Mm -hmm. usually okay. But it's like giving yourself that safety net there going like, no matter what happens, I will be okay. Did you know I give away a new free reading each month to a listener who leaves a five-star rating of this show on Apple Podcasts or Amazon? After you leave five stars, go over to the Contact Me page on my website, theangelmedium.com. 
fill out the contact me form, letting us know that you gave five stars. That way we can contact you when you win. The more five stars you leave, the more chances you have to win. And your name always stays in until you do. Don't forget to stay subscribed to our emails so that you know when you've won your free session with me. Sending you so much love and gratitude for your support on this. Thank you. Now let's dive back into the show. You know, and it, as far as like exploring that with horror, yes. And, you know, in, in a larger sense, publishing in general is mm -hmm. I feel like it's such a difficult industry that you're constantly, you know, the worst case scenarios do happen a lot, but you keep going and you keep pushing and you keep, you know, hopefully you've learned from whatever has happened and you just keep going. And that's kind of what sustained me throughout my entire career, through all of my, you know, professional relationships is that you just keep going because, you know, whatever the worst thing to me with writing would be to not write. So, yeah. you know, you, you just, you just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually that's what the book is about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, to kind of move the conversation in a different direction, I know yeah. that you have a brother who's on the other side mm -hmm. and I'm so sorry for. Thank for you. Loss. I know, though, that he's come through to you all in your family, just in different mm -hmm. ways. So I wondered if you'd share those angel stories with us. Sure, sure. And actually, one happened recently. It was on the day that Hex Education launched. Um, we were doing a book signing at a bookstore here. And I'm not someone who loves public speaking. I, I mean, I don't, well, I don't really know anybody who loves public speaking, but you know, it just, it's not, I'm used to sitting behind a computer and, you know, being by myself as opposed to standing in front of people and being professional. So I was really, really nervous. And um, that day I was getting ready in the afternoon, kind of pulling some stuff together. And um, I wanted to bring a framed picture with me to kind of put on the table um, where I'd be giving my talk and doing my signing. It actually was a picture of my cat. So <laughs> funny aside, because there, there's a talking cat in the book and I was going to bring a picture of my cat who was the inspiration it sounds so ridiculous so anyway so I was looking for a picture frame and I was couldn't find an empty one I didn't want to have to go buy one so I went in my garage and in this box of stuff I found this eight by ten picture frame it kind of it looked like it had some stuff in it I was like whatever I'll take it out you know this doesn't need to be perfect so I opened up the back of it and I pulled out what was there and the picture had been turned around so I couldn't see what it was but so when I opened it up, it was an eight by 10 picture of my brother from when he was in college. And I have no idea how it got there. The frame must have been from my parents, I guess, at some point, and somehow it wound up in my garage. And somehow it was the, you know, the frame that I opened up, but I knew immediately it was him. He was a very, very funny guy, you know, always playing jokes and pranks on people. And I immediately knew that I could picture him laughing about this being like, Oh, are you nervous? Here's, you know, a kind of a dorky <laughs> picture of me from college. Like, and it totally made me laugh. And I was like, Hey, Chris, what's up? <laughs> um, awesome. And it made me feel better. You know, I still, of course, had to give the talk and all that. But it definitely, it, it was his way of saying, like, good job, you know, so to speak. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, what was coming in though, while you were talking is you guys, I'm so sorry about this too. Um, Elle wanted to go like make a care package for Paige, uh, like the, the day that the dog passed away in the spring. Oh and, my um, gosh. But I feel like the dog misses the cat. Like as you were talking that entire time, I feel she like. She loves the cat. Yeah, <laughs> she, she did the cat absolutely hates her like hates well the cat hates everyone like but she would always try to be friends with Rosie and Rosie was not does not want to be anyone's friend at all <laughs> because she wouldn't uh well your puppy on the other side said like um they wouldn't let up uh it wasn't just your brother it was both of them oh sweet Lucy yeah when we lost Lucy it was over the summer it was she was my dog she was only three. It was like, you know, one of those horrible scenarios where it was like 10 days from where she was fine. And then she looked a little sick. And then she was really, really sick. 
And I mean, it was just so shocking. And, but I did have this sense after she passed that I, I mean, certainly I knew when she was here, even like she's here for me, you know, like she, she is my, I'm her person and she's mine. And, and I had this sense of when she passed. So we got her about a year after my brother passed. He passed about four years, four years ago ish. Um, we got her about a year after that. And part of that t- was like an emotional support dog for me. Um, and when she passed, I had, I, you know, was absolutely devastated, but I had this sense of like, she thought I was okay. So she knew it was okay to move on, I you know? No idea. Yeah. But I yeah, like, I could tell that she was like, you're good now. Like, not, I mean, you know, not like fixed and perfect, but right. certainly, or she was like, I got you through, Um, you know, so now I must go. Oh, I just have chills right now. Oh, Um, and my next book is dedicated to her because I was in the middle of writing it when she moved on. Um, So I was like, well, she's definitely the next, she gets the next book. Sorry, kids. I'm not dedicating (laughs) this one to you. (laughs) It's to the dog. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love that. That's so sweet. Yeah. Any other good stories you want to share of Chris coming I through? I so I had one. It actually relates to the dog too, uh, to Lucy. Um, I was walking her. This must have been last summer, and I would always take her for walks around the neighborhood just to get out. And she was like so furry and cute. Everyone would always stop. And but one time we went down a street that I don't think we had been down before, and there was this little chihuahua that was playing um, in someone's front yard and came right up, came right up to Lucy and they were sniffing each other. And I was like, okay, cause she's, wasn't normally super friendly with other dogs, Yeah, but you know, they were getting along and then, you know, I'm kind of standing there and the owner comes out and it's this man, maybe in his sixties, he has kind of longish gray hair. He's barefoot. He's wearing a grateful dead t-shirt And, you know, I'm talking to him for a few minutes. He's the nicest guy. And I just had the best feeling in talking to him for a few minutes. And I'm noticing his Grateful Dead shirt, um, which is a band that my brother Chris loved. And I was just getting such good vibes from him. And so I went to leave and he asked me my name and I told him and he said, it was nice to meet you. My name's Chris. And I was like, oh, you know, it was just one of those moments where you're like, yep. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's I mean, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and we have a lot of stories. So my family, you know, moving to my greater extended family, we have a thing in our family. This isn't just with my brother with dimes. Yeah. I don't know if I've heard apparently other people have this too, but it started with, so my mom growing up, she would always, or my grandmother growing up, would tell my mom and her siblings whenever they left to bring a dime because that's how much a phone call cost. So if they were out and ever needed help or needed to talk to her or call someone, they would have a dime to do so from, you know, a payphone back in the, back in the olden days. And so after my grandmother passed, my mom started to find dimes in really weird places, like where they shouldn't be. And a lot of times it was like if she was going through something or she had, you know, it was like a big life moment, good or bad. And so she started to find these and she realized eventually that they were from her mom saying, hi, you know, it was the phone call. It was the lifeline. And so I was raised with anytime you find a dime, you know, that's grandma saying hello. And so with my first child, I had a really terrible delivery. It it was a C-section. I was fully put out for it. It was a pretty traumatic delivery. But after it was done and, you know, and everyone was okay, I was in the room and my husband and I are exhausted and he goes to open the like, they, you know, how they have those chairs that like fold into beds, like for the husbands, you know, presumably to sleep in or the spouses. And so he opens it up and like sitting in the middle was a dime. Uh, I was like, "Hey, Grandma, <laughs> we see you. Thanks. Yeah, I made it through." Oh my! But goodness. I mean, we have so many stories like that, you know, from my family. You know, my aunt was in driving in a terrible snowstorm. Didn't think she was gonna make it. She came home and a dime fell out of her um, the cuff of her pant leg. Wow! You know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, we definitely all of us really do have a connection to everybody that's moved on and fully are invested in all of that. 
I love how your family like really continued that tradition before it was kind of like popular trendy per se. Oh yeah, this has been right, and, right because I feel like now it's definitely something people you know are more open, open to talk about. Whereas before it was very like maybe don't mention this to anyone <laughs> kind of thing. But I mean, it's always been a part of my life. You know, it was never weird or strange to me. And that's how I'm raising my kids. You know, the joke now is, of course, like, well, why does it have to be a dime? What about inflation? You know, can we have a quarter? Can we have, you know, a dollar coin? <laughs> Let's up the ante a little bit here, guys. <laughs> right. And there's no pay phones anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is yeah. hysterical. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. I love that. Oh, Maureen, I love you and your family. You all are just amazing. Thank you. Tell everybody where they can find you and your work and your books. Wonderful. Um, So my website is MaureenKilmer.com. I am on Instagram as author Maureen. Um, My Facebook is just more personal, just, you know, it's pictures of my family and things like that. So, but to connect with readers on Instagram or my website would be wonderful. And I would love to hear from anyone. Yay. Will Hex Education, I'm going uh, to the airport tomorrow. Will that be at the airport this time too? I don't know. I have no control over distribution (laughs) with my publisher. It might be, it might not be. (laughs) I'm taking a picture next to it if it is. Oh, wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for being on the show, Maureen. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. I really appreciate it. Of course. Oh, my love. Yay. Thank you. Beautiful soul, thank you so much for joining me today. My name's Julie. You know I'm all about connecting you with messages from your angels and loved ones on the other side. If you've been listening today and you're super excited and just have to know which angels are around you right now, who's connecting with you, and what messages they have for you, go to theangelmedium.com. Register for a session. You can do a reading with me or a member of my team, and we can help you in making sure that your angels are doing the very best they can to support you and guide you to your best life. If this sounds like you, virtual sessions, they're only offered on my website. Sign up today. And if you're the person who's really excited, you can sign up for my Angel Reiki School to become a certified angel messenger. That's for the healers among us who feel called to grow their intuition to the max and serve humanity with their gifts. You'll learn Reiki, mediumship, how to deliver angel messages, and how to get clients. That's the Angel Reiki School at theangelmedium.com or DM me on Instagram at Angel Podcast with any questions. Before you go, connect with your angels by placing your hands on your heart. Take a deep breath. Imagine a doorway filled with God's unconditional love is right in front of you. Step into that love and feel it as it fills your body, chakras, and auric field. Now ask your angels, what would you have me know today? And open yourself to the positive, loving messages they have just for you.